Today I'm uh, very happy to be here, first time um, in uh, Stockholm as not as a tourist, rather as a professional. And I would like to echo the first words or the theme of the conference that it is a hidden disease. But more than that, it is a ignored, underestimated and um, understudied disease. Yeah. So um, the last five years have been quite successful. Um, in terms of how much we know about the pathomechanism of the disease. So today I'm not going to talk too much about science, rather we, I, would, I will try to talk about the, um, what we do, why we are so passionate about this disease at the level of a basic science researchers. I'm, I'm not a clinician, so why I am so excited to um, understand this disease and what we are doing in our lab. So, as I always say, we are who we are because of you, mostly patients and our collaborators, the clinicians, who has um, helped us to be here. We are supported by many charity organizations, um, foundations all over the world, as well as uh, national funding bodies from uh, Germany, and moreover, the uh, financial as well as the moral support from the MECFS patient community, which is uh, wonderful. Um, people always say that why is it so difficult to understand MECFS? Of course, it is difficult at the level of the clinics, but it is also difficult at the level of treatment because we do not know much about the disease. We do not know the any biomarker that can give a uh, signature to this disease, differentiate it from the other diseases. And then on the basis of that, if we can find a treatment. And why is it so difficult? Because when we try to find a biomarker, we try to look into blood, mostly serum, plasma samples, sometimes blood cells like T cells and B cells, they are all in the peripheral circulation. But if you really carefully look into patients, majority of the clinical features of these patients are not exactly in the blood, but rather in the localized tissues. Some of them have extreme connective tissue di disorder. Just to give one example, um, some of them have uh, brain fog, uh, issues with uh, functioning of the brain. Some of them have extreme fatigue and um, issues with uh, circulation of blood and uh, autonomic nervous system and things like that. So these are the far sight tissues, localized tissues, where the clinical feature is sown. But we are looking into the blood to find a biomarker or a treatment, which is partially correct. You see, do see things in the blood, but I personally believe that there is a lot happening in core localized tissues rather than in the blood. So we need to go beyond to these reasons to find actual cause of the disease. There is another aspect of the disease, which is, uh, we, so we, we call it as a mosaic disease. Uh, in the terms of Robert Fair from uh, California, we do not have diseased cell throughout the body. We have only a percentage of, very tiny percentage of cells, tissues, who act, where actually the disease is manifested. But the entire consequence we see at the level of a person. Yeah? So that's why it's a mosaic disease. So another aspect which is very important is ME is a unique disease in the sense that rarely we have the opportunity to look into the development of the disease. So what happens when you first develop the disease, the symptoms? Um, I hope this is working. So um, you basically um, keep going through the general practice nurse, then you refer to the hospital. Many patients grow through um, solitary treatments. They are ignored. They stay at home, and then tons of medical tests, diagnostic tests, and you just go through this vicious cycle for years, sometimes several months to sometimes 10 years, 20 years, things like that. And then at the end of this page, you get your diagnosis as you have ME-CFS, yeah? So this phage, when you start the disease and when you turn 
at the end with the diagnosis of MECFS lasts sometimes several years. Now the question here is that, do you have the same disease state or same state um, uh, or the same condition when you started the disease? I personally believe that if you really want to diagnose the disease and treat the disease, you need to focus on this stage, not on this stage. There is a lot of difference happening between this time and depending on some patients. If a patient is sick for 25 years, I don't think that um, uh, it is possible really to characterize the disease, the primary cause of the disease after 25 years. So what we have been trying in our lab to, to understand the beginning of the disease, what happens during the early stages of the disease, why some people develop disease, some people uh, overcome out of the disease. Yeah, um, We got an opportunity in 2019. We had COVID, a pandemic, a big disaster for the humanity, but that gave us a one wonderful opportunity to understand how chronic viral illness can start with an infection. So what we have been doing from the last three years is to follow these patients who have now COVID-induced MECFS. So it's now three years into the uh, life, and we have been able to understand many aspects of the disease through the early stages of development of the disease. So I am going to uh, uh, share some of the uh, data with you. So um, what I'm going to uh, show you uh, is a study which is now available in the uh, Med, Arch uh, Med Archive as a, as a preprint. Uh, soon we hope that uh, the final version of the paper will come out. So if you look into these uh, preprint, you will see these data over here. So we are talking about here um, a comparison of healthy controls to MECFS, and we are comparing this to COVID-induced MECFS, yeah? Now, uh, we have a large cohort of uh, healthy controls over here who are not only uh, uh, part of it is uh, selectively uh, um, uh, recruited to the clinic in uh, Charity Berlin, but a large part of these healthy controls are actually uh, self-declared random individuals from general population. So we believe that you can probably get a best comparison if you don't pick your controls. They should be completely random. And we have a large cohort of MECFS patients. I would, should emphasize that these MECFS patients are uh, quite older into the disease duration. They are not very uh, freshly uh, uh, or developing uh, MECFS patients. Now we have a first cohort of patients who are into uh, six to 12 months after being SARS, uh, first time SARS-CoV-2 positive. Yeah? So uh, very uh, well designed cohort of patients. Now we have three different groups over here. We have a group who um, got infected with COVID, then recovered. They are um, called as no long COVID group. They might have some symptoms, but officially in the, in the, in the criteria of whether these patients have long COVID or not, they would not be called as long COVID patients. And there is a group where it is mild long COVID. They have some clinical features, which is not really a healthy uh, group of patients. But they are, again, when we talk about the 12 uh, clinical parameters on the basis of score is given and a person is declared as long COVID, they don't fall into this long COVID group. They are called mild long COVID group. And then we have a severe long COVID group. So if you would like to learn about how the long COVID patients are actually uh, diagnosed on the basis of this criteria, I would recommend you to uh, study uh, or read uh, these papers. Um, then um, in the second set of patients, which we are now recruiting, is up to 18 to 24 months after being SARS-CoV-2 positive. So these are the patients who come back to the clinic from the first cohort. They are still ill and they would like to contribute to the uh, study what happens to them after another 12 months. We still, so we do all our study in double-blinded fashion, so we don't know yet how many of them are uh, um, um, belonging to which group, but I would like to share that there are uh, 140 patients we have. So all these are coming from uh, the German national study uh, in Würzburg and uh, Kiel. And uh, recently we managed to um, acquire a large uh, MECFS cohort from the QRME uh, UK MECFS Biobank, which uh, 
has 100 healthy controls and 200 MECFS patients. And um, I hope that in near future, I will be able to access samples from the uh, Burger Clinic over here. Um, and um, hopefully we can, um, we can, um, uh, um, we can uh, find um, some answers from patients from this uh, reason. Now, one thing I just briefly will touch, I know some of my colleagues will talk about it probably uh, more, that in the beginning, in, in 2020, uh, January, uh, when Corona was just starting to uh, take over our life, we came up with experimental evidence that um, probably the coronavirus infection has a different uh, clinical feature, but more than that, it is actually reactivating herpes viruses. Herpes viruses, those are latent, and we all have one or other herpes virus in our body. Almost 99% of the general population have either EBV, herpes virus type 1, type 2. Uh, we have HHV6, A6, B7, which is also inherited. Up to 2% of human population can inherit these viruses from their parents. So having one copy of the virus in every somatic cell of the body. So we're talking about a large chunk of hidden viral genome in our body. And we showed first evidence that, yes, these viruses reactivate. We still don't know exact mechanism, but they reactivate after corona infection, and we hypothesized that they are going to complicate these issues. That time, long COVID was not a term, but it came out later. So now, in this study, what we are trying to show here is that uh, using a very unique uh, um, assay, which is developed in our lab, in our collaborator's lab in uh, US, we look for a very conserved protein called the DUTPase protein in herpes viruses. They are conserved all over the uh, uh, animal kingdom. We all, human beings, also have DUTPases, but the herpes viruses have a DUTPase which is completely different than any other uh, organism. So um, uh, we believe that these DUTPases have lost the function of DUTPases as such, but they are doing something else. And they are very early proteins, and we develop antibody against these DUTPase proteins once the herpes virus reactivates. And our colleagues from US, they have already shown that the antibody against DUTPase proteins are a sort of a marker in MECFS patients and GOL4 patients and things like that. So we tried to look uh, uh, the, into these patients, and we saw that um, MECFS patients have a statistically significant uh, increase in reactivation of uh, particularly the EBV. Uh, you can see that the antibody against EBV duty base is very high. So this is not a quantitative assay. What we developed now, we are in a stage to do quantitative assay for all the nine herpes viruses, but this is the very early stage. So we try to uh, divide these data into uh, either the antibody is not there or it is low, moderate, and high. You can see that we do see a certain amount of healthy controls showing very low amount of antibodies. This is common for herpes viruses. But in MECFS patients, we have an increase in the antibody levels. So not only for this, we also have increase some level or increase of HHV6 duty base also. But if we look into the uh, long COVID uh, group of patients, we uh, see that um, um, the, um, uh, the, the EVB reactivation is very prominent in uh, mild and severe long COVID patients. But more than that, which is very interesting for me particularly, is uh, the HSV1 duty page, which is very high in severe long COVID group. And uh, the decrease in antibody response against HHV6 in the severe long COVID group. It's very interesting. We are trying to understand the role of these duty pages. We now know that they affect mitochondria. The beta herpes viruses, the CMV herpes virus, the CMB, the HHV6, the A, B, C, and 7, they actually target these duty page proteins into the mitochondria. So once they are expressed inside the cell, they just disrupt the mitochondria. The other duty pages like EVB duty page, it goes into the nucleus, but it binds to cytos cytoskeleton of the cells and dismantles the mitochondria. So this is the, the molecular part of the study, what is probably not very interesting at this moment. But um, it's very clear now, the herpes virus reactivation is one prominent effect after the COVID infection, which overlaps with the symptom uh, symptoms and development of MECFS. Now, what we are trying to understand, if you know the history of development of MECFS research, there are many labs, not only my lab, Ron Davies from uh, San Francisco, uh, Oyster Fluge from uh, Bergen in Norway, they all came up with one single conclusion that 
it is a mosaic disease and there is something in the serum, something in the body fluid which keeps the entire body in the disease state. So some serum transferable factor is responsible for the manifestation of the disease. And we also came up with the same ideology. So we are looking into potential factors. And one of the potential factors that we are look, focusing is immunoglobulin. The immunoglobulin, which is produced by the B cells, probably has something to do with it. We all know now, by now, that the COVID is, uh, after the SARS-CoV-2 SARS infection, we develop autoimmunity. So I will try to focus here a little bit on this part. So what we do in our lab is we recruit MECFS patients. We try to uh, isolate uh, immunoglobulins, purify immunoglobulins, mostly IgG from these patients, and create a sort of a biobank. We try to uh, um, um, purify these, uh, these IgGs and um, try to understand if we can transfer the disease phenotype at the cellular level, as at the experimental level, from the patient IgG to a healthy cell. So the idea is that you purify the IgG, take a healthy cell, expose the IgG to the healthy cell in culture, and try to see if you see mitochondrial uh, uh, mitochondrial uh, changes, you can see mitochondrial metabolism changes and other things that we normally see in MECFS patients. So one of the data which came out to be very interesting for us that, yes, if you take the IgG from MECFS patients, particularly the severe MECFS patients, and you expose them to primary endothelial cells, not the tumor cells in culture, the primary endothelial cells, then they cause extreme changes in the mitochondrial morphology. They fragment the mitochondria, and we could show, we, uh, we, we, uh, we have uh, developed uh, algorithm to quantify this. But not only that, we show that uh, at the molecular level, uh, proteins like Mitofusion 1, PLD6, the mitochondrial proteins go down, and as a result of which the mitochondria fragments. Now, when we're doing these experiments, we are always keeping in mind that we are taking the IgG, purified IgG, and putting into the cells. So we are not only putting IgG into the cells, we are also putting all the proteins that are binding with IgG, mostly the activated immune complexes. So what we do simultaneously is we also try to do mass spec analysis and try to understand what is the composition of IgG in patient versus controls. Yeah? And one very unique thing that we do in comparison to others is that we recruit spouse of the patients as an important control. Because we feel that the microenvironment in which the patients live, the small geographical area within the house, can play a very key role in the disease development. And probably that is the reason why there are many ME patient families where there are more than one person is sick in the same family. So for us, it's very important that we choose or we advise the spouse of the patients. They are almost in the same age group. And if they can contribute as a control, now, this has helped greatly for us to minimize our data. So anyone who is doing experiments in the lab knows that doing an experiment leads to results, new results, tons of results. Now, how you can interpret this data? And we have seen that including spouse in your studies gives you results which you can easily take out from your exciting set of results, because this is something which is coming from the geographic region. I will show you one example, for example, over here. So um, when, you, when we do mass spec, this is a, a picture which is one spouse versus one disease uh, uh, patient control. So if you plot these proteins that came out in the mass spec, you will see that in the disease, there are a lot of, uh, or in the patient, there are a, a bunch of proteins which is uh, present in more amount in the disease uh, person than the uh, spouse. One of the protein that was uh, interesting for us is FCN2. Why FCN2? It is uh, called as Phycolin2. It is associated with diseases like rheumatic fever, which is again autoimmune disease. Um, it is um, important for initial triggering of complement cascade, and it's very important for calcium ion pathways. And it has functions, known functions in innate immunity through activation of the lectin complement pathway. If you look into the literature, lectin complement pathway is one of the affected pathway in the MECFS patients. So it was very exciting for us. And it is uh, not highly expressed or not present in high amount in all the patients, but 60% of our patients in this study had high amount of FCN. So if you plot all the patients into this figure, you see that overall 
patient, uh, the amount of FCN2 in these uh, complex is more, and some of them even have outliers, like extremely high amount. Now, this picture came out yesterday night at 10 o'clock, my uh, student sent me. So we tried to de do uh, ELISA assess to look into a larger cohort. Now, it looks very interesting here. You have a healthy control. You see that MECFS patients have more or less the same amount, but there are a bunch of patients who have increased amount of uh, Ficolin 2, uh, which comes out to be only one star uh, significant, not, not really. As I said, it's not there in every patient. But interesting, if you compare to other autoimmune diseases like sclerosis, you do see similarly a bunch of patients having high amount of FCN2. So for me, as a basic science researcher, this is something which is related to autoimmunity, but not particularly to MECFS. So by using spouse as a control and other autoimmune diseases as a second control, I am in a position to tell, OK, if certain marker is interesting for me, or it has probably not significant uh, contribution to ME. Just to give you an example. So um, when we did this study, we have, as, as I showed in the mass spec data, there are tons of proteins. But there are three proteins which came out to be fascinating or interesting for us. So you see here, these are the healthy controls. These are the MECFS patients. And you see that this protein that we are talking about over here are uh, present in a higher amount, so red means higher amount, uh, in the healthy controls, uh, but in MECFS patients, they are uh, decreased. And they are uh, transferrin, serotransferrin, alpha-2 microglobulin, and fibronectin-1. Now, the first two, the serotransferrin and alpha-2 microglobulin, is important for transport of iron into the cell and how iron is utilized inside the cells. This is a completely different aspect. Probably in another meeting, we will talk about it. But today, I'm going to talk about fibronectin-1. Fibronectin-1 is a very well-studied protein, a huge protein of almost 400 kilodalton. is involved in wound healing. It is an important part of extracellular matrix. It is an important part of the blood clotting process. So we try to understand, OK, why fibronectin is low in the immune complex. Fibronectin binds to C1 and C3 complement proteins and is very essential for fighting against certain bacterial infections like Borrelia yeah, or Staphylococcus. And also, it is in, important in uh, HIV infections. So we try to see if these proteins are actually decreased in general, or they are more in the circulating blood or the serum, but they are not incorporated into the immune complex. That these are two different functions. So we try to understand their protein levels inside the serum. And you can see that in the MECFS patients, there is a significantly high amount of circulating fibronectin. And if you look into the comparison to the long COVID group, no long COVID, mild long COVID, and severe long COVID group, you don't see any uh, increase in fibronectin is the, in, the, in the no long COVID and mild long COVID group. But severe long COVID patients do so some amount of increase in this uh, uh, protein. But interestingly, when we go into the follow-up uh, cohort, that means the patients, 140 patients from this group who are now gone into 24 years, uh, 24 months after the first COVID infection, you see that they have started to increase the amount of fibronectin coming back to uh, a significantly high levels. But if you compare to the other type of autoimmune diseases like sclerosis with fatigue and without fatigue, just to see if fatigue has something to do with it, you see that there is no significant increase in the fibronectin. So there is something very interesting going on here. The MECFS patients have, in general, high amount of serum fibronectin. And the same thing is happening in COVID also. And if you look into those uh, small cohort of patients that we have now officially declared as COVID-induced MECFS, they also have highly significant amount of fibronectin in their serum. Um, we can also uh, uh, associate the amount of fibronectin to the severity of the disease. So here in Europe, we mostly focus on the Bell scores. So if you take the bed-bound, most severe patients with the Bell score of 0 to 20, you see that these patients have extremely high amount of serum fibronectin. When we go for the Bell score 30 to 50, moderately uh, uh, ill patients use, uh, lose the significant value, but still they have high amount of fibronectin. <clears throat> uh, it's interesting, I'm not going too much detail, but it's interesting to see that females normally have higher amount of fibronectin in the serum, and male have low amount of fibronectin. So 
what we propose or hypothesize here is that um, why it is so female dominant disease, more female get ME rather than uh, male is that it's much more easier for a women to get that pathological amount of fibronectin. It just needs a little bit push. For a male, you need to really give a lot of push to reach to that stage. You need to induce a lot. So if you look into this data over here, you see that when you compare healthy control male versus MECFS, you see the difference is too high because they, the, the difference has to be a lot to reach. But if you look into the female healthy control versus MECFS, the difference is there, it is not much. So if you do statistics, your power will fail over here. So fibronectin is one of the very interesting candidate for us. And uh, it brings me to the next part of the talk, which is, um, when we, when we knew that the fibronectin is one key component of this disease and we would like to understand more about it, we tried to dig into the literature. As a basic science research, researcher, we tried to understand what other people have done in the field. One very interesting study came out with trypanosoma infection. It's a, it's a parasitic infection, and when you do infect mice with trypanosoma, you kill the mice, some of the mice, they die, and you see that the, the, the fibronectin the component of the extracellular matrix as well as the protein, they are fragmented after the trypanosoma infection. But those mice which survive, for the first three weeks, they have an increase in fibronectin in the plasma, but they have a decrease in the IgM response against the fibronectin. But when the mice recover, start re recovering from four weeks onward, you have a reverse trend. The um, increased fibronectin goes down, but the IgM response against fibronectin goes up. So we try to understand what does it mean. You don't have much literature uh, to, to refer here. Now, as I said, uh, this is very essential for fighting some of the bacterial infections and viral infections. Now, the IgM against fibronectin is not the normal IgM that you see in the clinics. So there are two different types of IgMs. One is infection-induced or antigen-induced IgM. So we, when you get an infection, the viral proteins come in your body and they induced a IgM response. That is called antigen-induced IgM. But there is other type of IgM which we call as natural antibodies, so natural IgM, that we start developing when we are in the mother's womb. And their job is, they are positively selected. They are not against a specific antigen. They are uh, multi-specificity. They have multi-specificity. And what they do is they do housekeeping job. They save or they prevent the development of autoimmunity. Because when a cell dies, our own proteins are degraded and they have to be removed from the system. The natural antibodies come into action they detect these dead cellular debris and remove it so that we don't develop autoimmunity. So we, when you lose these natural IgMs, you have a tendency to develop autoimmunity. So there are two different types of autoimmunity. One of the hypotheses is natural IgM-mediated autoimmunity. So we saw that normally healthy individuals have plenty of natural IgM against fibronectin. You do not have to see for this in patients, but rather in patients, it goes down. And uh, that's why we thought that it uh, belongs to the natural IgM. And one of the very interesting features of natural IgM is that you do not find the cells which produce the natural IgM in peripheral blood. Natural IgM is produced by plasma B1, B cells, and they are in primary hematopoietic stem cells in the, plas in the bone marrow, in the, in, the, uh, in, uh, in the liver, in the, uh, uh, the, the uh, primary hematopoietic uh, centers below the intestine, uh, epithelial layer of the intestine. Yeah? and they recruit the phagocytic cells to remove the dead and debris. So this is one recommendation if you would like to study more about uh, these natural IgMs. So we try to look into the natural IgM in patients. So interesting that um, if you look into the total MECFS population, the uh, older population, the patients who have been into this disease for a very long time, you don't see much difference between the natural IgM levels. But one thing which was dramatic, I, I will use this term dramatic, is that every patient who got infected with COVID has depleted the natural IgM even after 12 months of the COVID infection. Yeah? It is such a black and white picture. So if you, I, would, I sometimes suggest if you would like to know if you ever had COVID, you should check this natural IgM rather than any of the protein of the COVID. Yeah? So the antibody level probably goes down. So you see that 
there is a dramatic decrease in all the groups. Yeah, but there is a tendency towards more and more decrease in severe long COVID patients. And again, I would like to focus here that these are the patients into 12 months of COVID infection. So this is not the time when they have actually developed the MECFS-like symptoms or something like that. Yeah. If you look into the uh, follow-up cohort, they have started to recover. Again, I don't have the opportunity to differentiate this cohort now, but they have started to recover, but not all the patients are. They still have a uh, three-star uh, statistical significant difference in comparison to the healthy controls. When you look into the other type of autoimmune diseases, there is minor difference, but not so much. And we can see that the MECFS patients, particularly the CV1, with the Bell score 0 to 20, have tendency to have lower amount of natural hygiene, even if they are sick for 15, 20 years, they have a tendency to have lower amount of these natural antibodies. Unfortunately, the mild, moderate patients, they don't see much of a difference. Interestingly, the COVID-induced MECFS patients have started to recover the, um, um, it's the wrong picture over here, but um, they started to recover these uh, things. Now, what we propose here is that this is not a perfect dat data in the real world. But this combination of how much of fibronectin you have in your serum and how much of natural IgM you have has the potential to differentiate healthy controls from MECFS patients as well as different type of long COVID patients. So it's not perfect. If you put them into statistics, then the accuracy rate of differentiating the severe patients from healthy control is 80%. It's not more than 90%, which should be for a biomarker. But if you look into the COVID-induced MECFS, it is 85%. So the fresh, the, the, the onset of the MECFS is very early. So we think this is still not perfect, but at least we have something where we have a 85% success rate of telling, okay, this person is MECFS or not, this person is long COVID or not, yeah? Um, so the last slide that I would like to share with you, my idea about how the disease develop. I feel that um, there is two completely different aspects of the disease. The first is the, uh, I call it as the acute illness, when you first start developing the illness, yeah? There is the part where the virus reactivation actually plays the most important role. You have. Now is the time you can study SARS-CoV-2. So we have examples that many, not some of the work that is being done, but my collaborators in France, they have showing that the spike protein of the SARS-CoV-2 has the potential to reactivate human endogenous retroviruses. We have seen it with uh, herpes viruses also, yeah? So um, my lab focuses on uh, herpes viruses. We know that there is a crosstalk between herpes viruses and SARS-CoV-2. And we know that um, for different herpes viruses, the mechanism is different. For herpes virus type 6A or uh, type 6, there is a viral microRNA, which can affect the mitochondria and can contribute to the disease. But in general, for all the herpes viruses, these duty-based proteins are very important candidate, and they cause the the first onset of the disease, and this disease you can see in either in the brain, associated neuronal cells, astrocytes, glial cells, and other things. You can do see in muscle cells. You have, uh, you can see in cardiomyocytes. But the the important part is that it is not something that is going to kill you. But as these specific tissues are the tissues where the functioning of the tissue is very important. If you lose some part of the functioning of this tissue, if you have an inflammation in the cardiomyocytes, in the brain, then you are going to be affected at the whole body level, okay? So I always tell that mitochondria do play a role in this uh, setup, but this is probably because of the presence of some of the viral components in these cells. But then comes the second part of the disease where it actually decides whether you are going to have a chronic illness or whether you are going to recover. Some COVID-infected patients say, okay, I had um, long COVID. I went to yoga. I did uh, laughing therapy for six to eight months, and now I am back to normal life. So uh, ME is in the brain, in, is your head. It is not a biological disease because I did not do anything. I did uh, yoga and I am fine now. I tell them, this 
you are fine because you recovered within the first six to eight months or maximum 12 months of the disease because that's the time when auto recovery is possible depending on your immune system how you treat yourself and how you undergo treatment you have the potential to come back but some of people some of these patients they don't return to the normal state and that is probably decided by this phase where you start reactivating the herpes viruses deep into your primary hematopoietic stem cells or cells. So, for example, EBV. You find EBV latent in peripheral B cells, but the long-term latency of EBV Epstein-Barr virus is in the B1 B cells in the bone marrow. You do not reactivate under normal circumstances EBV in your bone marrow. You have EBV reactivation in the peripheral blood, but it has been shown in the past that very few, small percentage of patients, they reactivate EBV in the primary B1 B cells. Yeah? So I believe that when you start reactivating these viruses, very interesting. If you look into the literature, what are the different viruses which are often found in the bone marrow? you will find parvovirus B19, coxsackie virus, and many different type of herpes viruses. Yeah? So I think uh, when the reactivation reaches to the bone marrow or other type of uh, primary hematopoietic cells like spleen, blood, or mucosa-associated lymphoid tissues, these are the uh, plasma cells just below the intestinal epithelium. And their job is to prevent the, all the bacteria in your microbiota, in the gut, that try to invade your intestinal epithelium. So if you lose the natural IgM under your epithelium, you actually start changing your microbiota because all the other bacteria that normally do not get an opportunity to invade starts to colonize there. And that's what you see probably a lot of changes in the food habit, food intolerance, and a different type of intolerance in these patients. Yeah? So what happens when you start developing this? This uh, depletion of natural antibodies, they lead to the development of autoimmunity. And again, the autoimmunity in MECFS patient has no pattern. Every patient has different autoimmunity. Every person has a different antibody, autoantibody high in the serum. But overall, what you see is that um, then the develop into a chronic part of the illness where potentially the auto recovery is extremely difficult and you have different type of symptoms. So what happens over here is that depending on which type of autoantibody you are developing, you might lead into connective tissue disorders. I said that uh, fibronectin amounts are very high in the serum. The fibronectin can bind to TLR4 receptors on the surface of the cell, and they induce uh, um, um, a cycle of uh, events uh, constantly keeping the uh, innate immune response active. They, uh, uh, the autoantibodies can affect endothelial cells, and they can produce mitochondrial dysfunction, and it has um, potential contribution to microclotting that you see in the long COVID patients also. And if you talk into the old MECFS researchers, they also say that they have seen clotting in MECFS patients also. So we say that um, I am quite confident that we are in a stage we, where we can understand the pathomechanism of the disease starting from the very early phase to the late phase and that helps us to not only develop biomarkers, but also to decide what is the best phase where MECFS patients should go to the clinic. What is the best uh, marker which can decide who is going to develop into a chronic state and who is not going to develop into a chronic stage? Can we provide better health care depending on what is the status in the first one, two year of the disease development, which is I'm sure all of you agree that none of the patients reach to the stage of treatment during this time. Yeah? So I hope that this type of work will help in understanding and guiding the patients or the clinicians to find the intervention, intervention in very early in their disease development cycle. So with that, I would like to um, stop my presentation. Once again, um, we are uh, one lab probably in the world, completely dedicated to MECFS research. And we have been successful in um, acquiring funding from all over the globe and running multiple different projects, um, I would say tons of projects in the lab on different aspects of the MECFS. And um, um, we're still um, very happy to be um, associated with the patients. 
and uh, being helped um, uh, by the patients, um, both financially as well as uh, morally, to carry on our research. So thank you very much, and I will be very happy to take questions if you have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Prusty. And uh, actually, I think we have a couple of minutes for a few questions, right? So uh, do we have any questions here in the room to start with? Uh, I have one question. Why are not the MECFS uh, patient group divided into severity levels as the long-term COVID were? Um, it's very difficult. Um, so. Um, if we go to the clinic, um, like Charity Berlin, of course we have the possibility of samples getting um, divided into uh, severity. Um, so that's why we have almost 70% of the cohort that we are studying has the, the specific uh, Bell scores. But the rest of the 30% of the patients, um, particularly for Germany, have um, difficulty in um, getting the Bell score because they have never been referred to the clinic. because. In Germany, the system is different. There are two clinics, one in Munich and one in Berlin, and you can only go to those clinics if you're living in Berlin and Munich. If you're living anywhere else in the Germany, you have no way to go to any clinic, and there is no ME clinic in uh, Germany. So they all um, have the disease, they know it, uh, uh, the patients know it uh, by some consultation with their clinicians. Um, we try to, time to time, recruit these patients into our uh, study group, the reason is that there are many such families where more than one member are sick and you can only uh, study them if you go into those families. You talk to them patients, you recruit them, or they are very happy to be part of the study and you include them in the study. So we are very careful what we are talking about the Bell score. So when we are judging the severity, we take all those which are com coming from uh, clinic. So it's not small number like 10, 15. We have hundreds of patients, so we are in a position to conclude anything. That doesn't necessarily that we have to include all those patients where we don't know the Bell score or there is a confusion in the Bell score. Similarly, if you go to US, we have many patients from US where Bell score is not used as a parameter for severity they have different system of uh, judging their severity. So there we have the confusion of two different uh, criteria to uh, combine them. So we try to um, avoid when we try to conclude the severity of the disease uh, uh, and uh, try to compare them with something. Yeah. Thank you. More questions Thank you. in the room now? Anyone online now? I'm not sure if we have the possibility to. Okay, one more question. Yes. Sorry, is it a possibility to get a hold of these slides afterwards? Because I found this very interesting, and I would like just to look through them again. And sure. yeah, that was all. As I said, we always bring new data, fresh data, like last night data. <laughs> We don't care. It's all for patients, and um, uh, it's always good to um, get a, an opinion, an opinion from the patients. Yeah. Yeah. So I find it very interesting because this opens up a new uh, portfolio for us as practitioners. I'm a doctor, and I treat MECFS patients. Actually, I do a lot of serology on herpes virus, especially because I find a lot of patients do have reactivation of EBV, and especially CMV, actually, and. But still, just the possibility of maybe have early testing to, to be able to, to catch the disease early, I think opens up, opens up a window, which uh, just, this was a very good lecture. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Dr. Prusty.